without uh, further ado, I will transition us into our uh, very first uh, research breakout, which if you remember, uh, does focus on uh, thinking about the different ways that we talk about measuring teacher quality. And this was actually a theme that came up last night when we were talking with our educators of the year here in Massachusetts about needing to broaden how we think about and measure teacher effectiveness, which has really been a primary lever of policy change and work over the last decade or so. And so our um, research presentations will both focus on work that's being done in this area through several different uh, lenses, and then we'll be excited to engage in discussion. And I'm gonna turn it over to Olivia. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, welcome to breakout number one, measures of effectiveness centering best practices and outcomes for English learners and students with disabilities. My name is Olivia Chi. I'm an assistant professor here at BU Wheelock. I'll be the moderator for this session. In today's session, we'll be diving more deeply into how recent research is considering measures of effective teaching. So I'm sure that most folks attending the session would agree that high quality teachers are really important for determining student outcomes. But what does it mean to measure teacher quality? How do we do it well? And specifically our focus today, what does it mean to measure different aspects of teacher and teaching quality? among educators serving different populations of students who may have different needs. So first we'll have three lightning talks uh, by Dr. Nathan Jones, Dr. William Delgado, and Dr. Stephanie Curenton. Then we'll continue the conversation with our, discuss with our discussants, Heather Pesky and Andrea Zayas, followed by a question and answer session uh, with all of you folks. So without further ado, we'll dive right into our research presentations. First up, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nathan Jones, who will tell us more about classroom observations in the context of evaluating special educators. And a little bit of background, Dr. Nathan Jones is an Associate Professor of Special Education, affiliated faculty with the Wheelock Educational Policy Center, and he's a founding mem member of the BU Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences. In his research, Dr. Jones focuses on teacher quality, teacher development, and school improvement with a specific emphasis on conceptualizing and measuring teacher effectiveness. So take it away, Nate, whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Olivia, for the introduction and for everybody for having me this morning. I, I am going to do my best to be like lightning. Um, I will see how this goes, um, but that is not my natural pace. So I will work with that though. Um, so I am really excited to share this work with everybody. This is the culmination of an IES funded study that I have been leading over the last five years, um, focused on using classroom observations in the evaluation of special education teachers. Um, I am presenting this work on behalf of a very large team spanning multiple uh, institutions, including ETS and the University of Florida. The other thing that I will note as I'm jumping off here is even though I'm discussing the evaluation of special education teachers, um, I think the lessons from this research uh, are really about a broader range of educators. And it really has to do with who gets to define effective teaching. And when we say effective teaching, what do we mean? Effective teaching for whom? So our rationale underlying this work is that Observation systems are used in most all districts across the country for two purposes. One is for teacher evaluation, the formal evaluation that teachers are involved with each year. And second is teacher improvement. And one of the things that we've seen over the last five, 10 years is as we've retreated away from an enthusiasm for our formal teacher evaluation, we've seen more of an emphasis on this focus on teacher improvement. How can we use the data generated by teacher evaluation to help teachers develop over time? And for cost and scaling reasons, most districts use a single general protocol for all their teachers. Um, and one of the things that we sought to investigate was what are the trade-offs of this choice? The reason that we push on this question and the reason I'm excited about it is that we have a wide range of evidence at this point suggesting that effective teachers are those who can deploy a wide range of instructional approaches based on their student needs. So it is simply not sufficient to be using explicit systematic instruction for learners who are just starting to learn new information all of the time. It is also not sufficient to be using student-centered inquiry-based approaches all of the time, but instead, 
effective educators are those who can deploy a range of instructional approaches based on where their students are at and what their needs are. But that reality is often not reflected in the observation systems we use. They tend to carry singular definitions of good teaching. So I'm gonna be talking about the framework for teaching. This is an observation system used in many states across this country. While it is not used in Massachusetts, um, I think some of the lessons that I present here uh, have implications for Massachusetts, but also other states. Now, FFT is noteworthy because it emphasizes student construction of knowledge and student-mediated instruction. So effective instruction is instruction where students are in the driver's seat of the classroom. Now, this is not to suggest that this is not valuable for all students. However, one of the things motivating this work is that we have a body of research in special education suggesting that for kids with disabilities, um, they often benefit from more time involved in teacher-directed explicit systematic instruction. So for us, the question was, when we look at the use of an observation tool like this with special education teachers, does this tool capture their instruction? So as I shared, this was a, a study funded by the US Department of Education, along with my co-PIs, Courtney Bell at ETS and Mary Brownell at University of Florida. And our procedures here were that over a, a period of two years, actually, we ended up videotaping 50 special educators in Rhode Island, four times each. Um, these instruct these teachers were then scored by trained raters, uh, they were double scored, and we ended up comparing scores on the FFT to another measure that was more, more closely associated with special ed practice. Now, the important thing to note before I show the results of this work is that FFT is broken out into a few different domains. So one is classroom environment. The second one that we investigate is the quality of instruction. And it's the second one, how FFT defines effective instruction, which was the one that we hypothesized was going to be the place where we saw our special educators score low. Now, the other thing to note before I show the results is that FFT is scored on a one to four scale. Um, typically, as we see in research and practice, the one and the four are rarely used. Um, it is really ends up being a, a, a two point scale with a two and a three. So briefly, um, when I just show two things, so FFT is, as I said, we have this domain on classroom quality and this domain and in instruction. And what we saw is that our teachers were very much clustered on the low end of the distribution with an average roughly under 2.0 um, on the quality of their instruction. Whereas classroom quality, you know, the environment that kids were in was much higher on our scale. Now, this is actually pretty disconcerting. When we look at the performance of special educators on FFT relative to other teachers, this, these, these kinds of averages are way out of step with what we've seen elsewhere. I'm not gonna, I don't have time to break down all of these. Just to note though, briefly, that within domain three, there's these specific components of instruction where we even see means that are closer to 1.78, 1.93, and the vast majority of special educators scoring below a 2.5 on that four point scale. Um, so the other thing, just to wrap this up, is that in addition to this kind of crunch of, of special educators lessons within this very small range between about a 1.5 and a 2.5, when we look at their performance on an observation tool more closely aligned with special education, we see that that crunch on the FFT actually masks a much broader range of instructional quality. So when we use a tool that captures special educators instruction, we find that our sample, there's just much more variation that the FFT is not picking up. So collectively, these data suggest some serious concerns. One is that these scoring patterns suggest low overall performance, but that does not actually match the performance that we saw when we used an observation tool more closely aligned with special education. So what can we do? Just to wrap up before I, I turn it over to the next speaker, um, I just wanted to flag for folks that we have developed this toolkit to actually help principals and other administrators know what to look for when they observe special education teachers. So if they are using a tool and evaluation does that, that does not capture special ed practice, we wanted to help build administrator literacy around looking at what special ed practice looks like. So this tool is widely available. It is publicly available. There is the website. It's sites.bedu.edu slash SET leaders. Um, and just to preview what is included here, 
We end up uh, identifying five effective practices for special education. We also include resources for observers. Um, for each of those five practices, we describe what they look like. We describe why it's important for kids with disabilities. And we include sample videos of what the, those practices look like when used with kids with disabilities. So I thank you very much for your time. I appreciate the conversation and I look forward to the other talks. Thank you so much, Nate. I'm really looking forward to digging in deeper into the implications of your work um, in the discussion coming up soon. Um, so next up, we have Dr. William Delgado, who'll be sharing more about the heterogeneous effects of teachers across student groups. A little bit of background, William Delgado is a senior postdoctoral associate at Boston University Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. He's an economist from Columbia and moved to the US to get his master's and PhD in public policy at the University of Chicago. His overarching goal is to understand and address inequality and opportunities and to foster human potential. His current research studies uh, include teacher effectiveness and human decision-making with a focus on parents. So welcome, William. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Olivia, for the introduction and um, thank you everyone for being in this panel. Um, can you see my second slide? We can see it. Okay, excellent. Um, so I'm very excited about presenting uh, this research. So we know that racial, gender, and socioeconomic achievement gaps are a persistent and a stubborn fact across the US and also around the world. <clears throat> In Chicago public schools, for example, uh, the setting of this study, the black-white achievement gap is equal to the difference between an eighth grader and a fourth grader. Um, there uh, have been implemented uh, teacher-related policies uh, to close these achievement gaps. Uh, for example, one of those policies is increasing teacher diversity, uh, which increases the exposure of students to teachers of the same race and same gender. Another uh, policy is uh, racial and gender uh, 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 bias training, uh, which increases awareness and tackles conscious and unconscious biases. This study proposes a new policy tool uh, to close these achievement gaps. And this tool, I call it uh, a teacher comparative advantage, uh, which is a novel measure of teacher effectiveness that quantifies uh, uh, the teacher's contribution to equity. So an overview of this study, uh, I find that uh, teachers differentially affect their students and these differences matter. So teachers, I find that teachers affect black students and non-black students in different way. Um, and teacher comparative advantage, it measure, uh, it predicts uh, teachers disparate, disparate impacts. So for example, a teacher with one standard deviation in this comparative advantage measure for black students uh, would increase black students' test scores by one standard deviation uh, with no detrimental effects on non-black students. That is that uh, this teacher uh, closes achievement gaps by increasing black students' test scores without affecting non-black students. So it is contributing uh, to equity. So the data that I use for this study, uh, I use elementary and middle school students' data uh, from Chicago public schools and their math and English uh, teachers. The main outcome uh, is math and English test scores, uh, which are available. Uh, these are a standardized test. Uh, and math and reading are the available subjects uh, for this test uh, from 2008 uh, to 2016 uh, school years. So the method that I use, uh, it uses the value added model, uh, which is a statistical method uh, that is designed to estimate the teacher's average contribution to a student learning. So if a students were randomly assigned uh, to classrooms, uh, the average increase in test scores of a teacher's classroom would be the teacher's contribution to a student learning. However, uh, students are not randomly assigned to classrooms or uh, schools. Uh, parents choose where to send their uh, 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 parents choose where to send their students, their children to schools. 
Therefore, uh, this creates some differences in classrooms and the value added model takes those differences into account. Um, so I use this model uh, to estimate the teacher's contribution for different student groups. Uh, I, I use this, I estimate teacher value added by a student race. So I estimate the teacher's contribution to learning for black and non-black students uh, to better capture uh, the experiences of these students. And the teacher comparative advantage measure for black students uh, would be the difference between the value added for black students and the difference with, uh, uh, for value added for non-black students. Uh, given that we want to close the achievement gaps, non-black students is the reference group and the comparative advantage measure is relative to that reference group. So this is one of the findings of this study. So I find that teachers differ in their overall effectiveness and also on their contribution to equity. So in this graph on the right, um, each dot represents a different teacher. Each teacher is, uh, now has two values. One value is uh, uh, with respect to the overall effectiveness. That's the conventional teacher value added measure. That's on the horizontal line. And the second value is the teacher's contribution to equity, with, which is on the Y axis. Um, these measures are relative measures. So the average teacher has a value of zero and zero, zero for their overall effectiveness and zero for uh, the, uh, her contribution to equity. And every other teacher is relative to that average teacher. So teachers on the right, uh, quadrant one and four, are those teachers who are highly effective, uh, whereas teachers on the left are teachers who are less effective based on their conventional measure of teacher quality. Teachers who are above the average teacher, quadrants one and two, are those who have a higher contribution to equity relative to the average teacher. And teachers below uh, this uh, average teacher are, are those who have a uh, lower contribution to equity. So let's take, for example, these two teachers, teacher A and teacher B. So, these two teachers, if we only focus on the conventional measure of teacher quality, these two teachers have the same effectiveness. However, with a, a new measure of teacher quality, teacher B has a higher contribution to equity than teacher A. So this comparative advantage measure adds adds an additional uh, dimension to teacher quality previously not taken into account. Now let's take another example, uh, teacher C. Uh, teacher C uh, is based on, on the conventional measure of teacher quality. Teacher C will, will be categorized as a low effective teacher. However, with this comparative advantage measure, we can see that teacher C has a higher uh, contribution to equity. So if we assign this teacher C to a classroom that matches her comparative advantage, uh, she would be more effective. Um, one example why the comparative advantage measure is, is important. So let's come back to this example of teacher A and teacher B. Um, so if we had two classrooms and one classroom has more black students than the other classroom, then it would be both efficient and equitable to assign teacher B to the classroom with the larger proportions of black students and teacher, teacher A to the other classroom. In other words, by doing this, uh, one would maximize a student test scores and at the same time close achievement gaps. Then I ask, what are the teacher characteristics and what are some teaching practices of those teachers that have high contribution to equity? So I find that a few teacher characteristics are associated with uh, the teacher's comparative advantage. Uh, I find that teachers with a master's degree, they tend to have higher conventional value added measures, but uh, they have a lower contribution to equity. 
Similarly, I find that teachers with experience, they tend to have high conventional value added but lower uh, contribution to equity. Then I relate uh, this comparative advantage measure with various uh, teaching practices. So I use data uh, from classroom observations and the student surveys. Classroom observations uh, come from when evaluators come to the classroom and evaluate the teachers in several practices and give rate, rates to the teacher. I find that uh, these classroom observations, they are not as strongly associated with the racial comparative advantage uh, for black students but they are highly correlated with a comparative advantage for uh, female students. Uh, that's a separate uh, exercise that I do. However, uh, students seem to identify teachers with high contribution to equity. So teachers uh, with high racial and gender comparative advantage, they tend to receive higher student ratings on the classroom disruption and course clarity indexes. So to conclude, uh, this uh, teacher comparative advantage measure captures teachers' uh, differential effectiveness across the student subgroups. Um, taking into account uh, this measure into policy decisions could help improve both e equity and efficiency of education systems. And importantly, this comparative advantage measure does not require additional resources, uh, but a different way to look at the existing data. Uh, thank you for listening to this uh, presentation. Thank you so much, William. Um, I feel like you've given us a lot to think about in terms of how to measure te how teachers contribute to equity. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Um, but next we have Dr. Stephanie Carrington, who will be sharing about an observation tool for measuring equitable sociocultural interactions. So Dr. Stephanie Carrington is a tenured associate professor here at BU Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. And she's the director of the Center for the Ecology of Early Childhood Development. She studies the social, cognitive and language development of low income and minority children within various ecological contexts, such as parent-child interactions, early childhood education programs, early childhood workforce programs, and related state and federal policies. So welcome, Stephanie. Hello, so nice to be here today. Let me share my screen. Okay, we can see that, right? All right, so today I'm here, today, so I'm here to talk to you about um, bringing race into the classroom, um, describing the access tool and describing the access tool and its implications for a teacher education. So relationships are foundational for children's learning and children first began to learn through their interactions with their parents and family members. And so when children go into the form, their formal schooling, their relationships with teachers become important venues for learning. The problem is that these relationships with parents, these relationships with teachers is where um, unconscious racial biases seep in. And these unconscious um, biases can affect all aspects of teacher relationships, student teacher relationships. For example, research shows that white teachers have lower expectations for racially and ethnically diverse children's academic success and social skills. They also report being less emotionally connected to children of color. And these teachers also have more negative perceptions of children's behavior, which we see um, at, borne out in our disciplinary practices. And these, res these um, this results have actually, these re this results actually in having seen, I'm sorry, these results have actually been seen in developmental psychology and education literature um, across pre-K and grade through 12 um, over the course of several, several years. So the question I'm here to address today has implications for how we can change these biases through the use of a classroom assessment tool that is coupled with professional development. And the way in which we can do this is by first starting to reconceptualize how we see classroom quality. So for the past, 
For the past decade in the field, um, two decades actually, in the field of early childhood education, we've been spending a lot of time focused on trying to find the perfect measure of what we consider um, a global classroom quality. And by that, we mean quality that is sort of generic and supposedly good for all students. But what we know in education is that there's actually no generic sort of good quality or sort of generic um, classroom experience. Children's experiences are grounded in their culture and their identity, and they bring these things with them to the classroom. And these aspects of their, um, their personhood um, affect their relationships and their interactions in that classroom. So um, what, so what, the, what we need to do is start to think about how we can revamp um, this view of classroom quality in such a way that racial equity becomes center in our definition of what quality teaching is and um, what quality classroom experiences are. Because the way we've typically seen this um, in the literature, in the education and psychology literature to date is that the um, that we have this these conventional views of teaching quality and then racial equity is seen as something in addition to or something on the side. So it, there's really um, it's really important that we start to revamp our educate our point of view of what classroom quality is, because we see so many disparities in the school experience from preschool all the way through K through 12. We see disparities in resources across school districts um, across the nation in terms of school funding, um, teacher, um, teacher background and qualifications, also in terms of materials as well. Um, our schools, our pre preschool, as well as our K through 12 schools are highly segregated. Um, unfortunately, our preschools are even more segregated than our K through 12 schools. We also know that there's a disparity in school experiences because most of the curriculum that is taught is very Eurocentric in nature, and it's taught almost exclusively in English. And as I had mentioned before on the first slide, what we also know is that teachers' unconscious or implicit biases around race um, fuel these lowered expectations that they have of students and this disconnected relationships. And these things also lead to harsher disciplinary actions. So what we see across, um, across all of our data with school discipline from the Office of Civil Rights is that children of color are more likely to be suspended and expelled than um, white children are. And this occurs from the preschool level all the way up through the 12th grade level. So what, what we brought to the table here, what we're trying to do is to reconceptualize classroom quality so that the idea of what is general um, quality and what is racial equity quality is combined in terms of one measure. And so in the act, we call the measure um, access and it stands for assessing classroom social cultural equity scale. And there are six dimensions in access. One dimension is called challenging status quo knowledge, which means, um, that uh, teachers are incorporating materials and discussions in the classroom that are non-stereotypical in nature and that also show um, people of color having a sense of agency. The next, the second dimension is what we call equitable learning opportunities for racially marginalized learners. And these um, equitable learning opportunities, this, met, this dimension specifically measures teachers' behavior directed at the racially marginalized kids specifically. And it um, goes, it looks at things such as um, the level of difficulty in questioning. It looks at sort of a, whether or not there's a genuine emotional connection. It looks at whether or not um, the children of color are actually able to participate in these learning conversations and learning interactions as well, because the teacher is calling um, on them to answer questions. And, um, and then the third dimension is what we call inequitable discipline. So it's reverse scored 
And what it looks at is um, there are items that look at sort of the general discipline climate in the classroom. And then there are other items that look specifically at how discipline is directed towards racially marginalized children. And this is one of the areas too where um, access is very unique from um, some of the other measures that we have in our um, early childhood space because it is um, specifically trying to address differential um, disciplinary um, practices between um, RMLs and white children. We also um, have a dimension that looks at connections to home life, and this relates to um, sort of how teachers are bridging that homeschool connection. Um, there's also um, a dimension that's called personalized learning opportunities. And in that personalized learning opportunities, this is where um, this is where we're examining whether or not teachers are using a variety of learning modalities and a variety of materials. It looks at whether or not there are um, strong conversational feedback loops happening um, in the interaction. It looks at whether or not um, teachers are providing causal explanations for behavior um, and um, and it also looks at um, whether or not the activities um, that are happening in the classroom allow for creativity and for children to bring their opinions um, into, the, into the learning space. And lastly, we have a dimension that is really based upon um, how racially marginalized children are participating and engaging in that classroom space. It looks at their interactions with their peers in relation to um, how they're cooperating together, whether or not they have a genuine emotional connection with their peers, and whether or not they're talking um, with their peers about um, instructional related things, as well as maybe um, outside of school related conversations. So what we have found is that um, we have several studies um, that shows uh, repeated concurrent validity for the access tool with well-known widely used measures of classroom quality. Um, we've seen this in our 2019 paper that was published, but also in more recent samples um, in Nebraska in grades kindergarten through third, and also in a national sample of grades four through five. We also saw in our um, more recent child development um, paper that the access dimensions are predictive of child outcomes, um, but the rate, but it's moderate, it's moderated by the racial composition of children's classrooms, and such that the association between access scores and child outcomes in math and executive functioning skills are moderated between the proportion of how um, the percentage of racially mar marginalized children in that classroom. Let me show you a graph that um, shows that. So what you can see here is that our research show um, has found that the association between personalized learning opportunities and children's executive functioning differs as a function of the racial composition of the early childhood classrooms. So in this blue line, we have classrooms that are um, have a high concentration of racially marginalized children defined as defined as 60% or more of the classroom. And then we have the green line, which is a low um, classroom um, composition of racially marginalized children, which is 40% um, um, or less. And what you can see is that as teachers um, scores in, um, in in personalized learning opportunities increase, we see that also that there's a positive effect for um, children's executive functioning skills. And so the ultimate hope for this work is that the access um, framework, it, which includes the observation tool, as well as a suite of professional development, um, can help with um, teachers engaging in high quality teaching practice that really center racial equity. So we're in the process now of working with a publisher so that the tool can become available to districts and early childhood programs, as well as sort of develop a suite of professional development learnings and um, a book that looks at understanding and improving racial equity in the classroom using this access framework. So I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Stephanie. It's, that's really fascinating research on how to measure sociocultural interactions. Um, and so now um, I'll invite our discussants to join the conversation. We're very lucky to be joined by both Heather Pesky and Andrea Zayas. 
Heather Pesky is the Senior Associate Commissioner for Instructional Support at the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. There, she uses her experience as a teacher, policymaker, and researcher to lead a team working to ensure the state's 1 million students, especially those who are most vulnerable, learn according to rigorous standards and have access to high quality instructional materials and effective, well prepared educators. She has also held roles as Vice President of Programs for Teach Plus and Director of Teacher Quality for the Education Trust. She began her career in education as a Teach for America Corps member and elementary school teacher in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And Andrea Zayas is Balmer Group's National Director of K-12 Education. Prior to joining Balmer Group, Andrea served for three years in leadership positions at Boston Public Schools, most recently as its Chief Academic Officer. Previously, Andrea founded and led three organizations uh, that reach kids who are furthest from education opportunities, New Orleans Youth Alliance, Upstream Education Consulting, and La Cima Elementary Charter School in Brooklyn, New York. She has also served in diverse leadership roles focused on student success at established organizations, including the National Director of Regional Leadership Development for KIPP, Regional State Turnaround Superintendent in Camden, New Jersey, and Director for Charter School Accountability for the New York City Department of Education. So welcome, thank you so much for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to digging into your thoughts and reactions to these research presentations. Um, so I'll, I'd like to kick us off with sort of like a broad overview question and trying to get your reactions to some of this work. So all three of these papers, they simultaneously propose a more expansive understanding of effectiveness and also a more differentiated target approach. What do you see as some of the benefits of this reorientation and what may be some of its challenges? I think we're only pausing because we're not sure who's going first. Oh, um, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, send it to you, Heather, first. Okay. Um, so first of all, I, I found these research papers so interesting. As a state policymaker who leads a team called the Center for Instructional Support, where a lot of our work is focused on supporting teachers both in pre-service and then in in-service to be effective with their students. So the three papers made me think, which it was uh, like, they're just really compelling. So to the point to your question about um, expanding as well as targeting our definitions of, of effectiveness, I think this goes back to some questions that, um, that Dr. Jones raised, which are who gets to define effective teaching and effective teaching for whom? And I would add as well, um, what's our purpose here? And so we have a multitude of purposes. One is measuring teacher effectiveness. And that's really like determining to what extent teachers are well-serving students. And you can have a host of definitions under that phrase, well-serving students. A second purpose is evaluating, um, figuring out to what extent uh, teachers should be in classrooms with kids, to what extent they need additional support, to what extent do we need them to support them to do something different if that's the case, which is very small and slim. And then also we wanna promote improvement and we wanna provide teachers with meaningful feedback. So those are a multitude of purposes and the same instrument doesn't always meet all of those purposes. So I would add that as a policymaker, um, inevitably policy is a blunt instrument and it gets more blunt the larger the scale. So here at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education in Massachusetts, we tried to build an educator evaluation framework that rested on a definition of effective teaching that would be applicable to 79,000 educators, both teachers and principals across the state, serving nearly a million students. And our state is relatively small. So I think that's part of the, the difficulty in trying to uh, better target our definitions and our instruments and also part of the challenge and part of the opportunity. So I think I would just broaden this by asking the question of, if we wanna provide better supports for teachers to improve, what types of opportunities do we have and what kinds of instruments? And so I would broaden us beyond just the teacher evaluation system to looking at a variety of parts of our system from teacher pre-service and expectations for what we prepare teachers to do to teacher in-service, professional development, um, teacher professional learning communities that were mentioned last night. So like, what are the levers we have available to us and the different opportunities we have for supporting teachers to better serve their students? 
And then what tools can we use within those different levers? I'll pause and kick it off to Andrea now. Thanks, Heather. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I really couldn't agree with you more, Heather. I think the the, the core question um, is what is the purpose um, that through which for which we're using these tools. I really want to thank the researchers for their fresh, novel, innovative contributions um, to the field. Um, and I think as, as a system leader, I would have loved to have access um, to their thinking, um, in, in particular, uh, thinking about the comparative advantage score and how that could help to determine who our most effective teachers are. I, but taking a step back, there's an, a huge benefit to being able to, to more keenly and specifically pinpoint what the coaching points, areas of strength, areas of improvement are that, that, um, that we can provide to teachers, right? Absolutely, students stand to benefit and students that our researchers have described in a multitude of ways, right? And our Kino also described as our linguistic, uh, linguistically gifted students, right? Our students with disabilities, uh, racially marginalized students, students with disabilities really particularly stand to benefit when teachers have better information about how to support them, about how to create a sense of belonging, about how to respond in culturally relevant ways, right? Um, how to systematically provide teacher-directed instruction if that's really what's needed. Um, our, our systems currently don't do that. And I agree, Heather, right, to the, to the point that we have um, blunt instruments in some ways by design because they need to serve so many different um, types of educators, so many different um, uh, environments in our school buildings and, and districts uh, across the Commonwealth and across the country. Um, that said, I think, you know, I think about it in two ways. We're looking both, we're looking for these tools to do too much. We're looking for them to provide us the kind of uh, information that we need as system leaders to evaluate teachers for workforce purposes, raises, new roles, continuation of contracts. And on the other hand, we're also looking for these tools to give us the kind of information and give teachers the kind of information that they need to grow, to become better educators um, and to better serve their students. For a number of reasons, sometimes those purposes are cross purposes, um, sometimes even in conflict with each other. Um, the evaluation systems themselves sometimes don't lend themselves to the, the kind of frequent formative information that teachers really need in order to have that information um, transform their teaching, inform their teaching and really be reflected um, in their classroom practice every day. So more tools, more robust tools along with support and training could potentially increase capacity. Yet I would question how might we potentially decouple those two purposes to have both be even more effective. Thank you both so much. I feel like I heard, uh, I heard a lot, I heard both of you discuss this need for instruments for, that may be separate for development of teacher skills and maybe separate tools for evaluation. And so as we're thinking about, you know, having these more nuanced measures of teacher effectiveness, and maybe you might wanna to speak to this in just one domain or the other, maybe just specifically in terms of how to use these tools for teacher development. What might be some pathways forward for adopting these more nuanced measures, like the ones discussed in these papers within states and districts? What might be some potential hurdles in adopting or using these types of tools? I'll, I'll start with uh, Andrea. Thanks, Olivia. So picking up on the, on the idea that the two purposes may be in contradiction to each other, um, right? When we think about, uh, well, let's see. Um, so if we, if we think about um, the quantitative aspect of uh, comparative ad advantage, I think that most easily lends itself to being incorporated in an evaluation system as an algorithm, right? As, a, as, a, as, an, as an aspect um, of 
uh, of a score that can be given to a teacher, right? And incorporated into, into evaluation processes. Um, Dr. Currington and Dr. Jones's work, on the other hand, I think could more easily lend themselves to the qualitative and coaching aspects um, that can be embedded into you know, weekly coaching meetings inside of a coaching structure, into peer observations, and even into the ways in which um, I would ideally like to see teachers inviting students and families and having systems invite students and families into the observation process to more robustly give teachers um, experiential data, including family and student satisfaction and experience information into that um, holistic view of you know, how a teacher is performing. Um, so separating those two, I would see Dr. Delgado's work being more easily applied in an evaluation context um, and the other two pieces, uh, the other two tools incorporated into a coaching structure. I think that's a uh, really helpful, um, really helpful perspective. And I think the way I was thinking about this in terms of development and evaluation is thinking about what the tools do and then also like what's included in them and what the results are that are being measured. So for example, um, in Dr. Currenton's tool, the, there are these six dimensions of the tool. And I think about the developmental aspects of those different dimensions because they're, they're, they could help a, a teacher in the early stages of career better understand the different dimensions of being an impactful teacher. Um, and I wanted to dig in even more to learn like, what does it mean of these six dimensions? Like what does challenge the status quo look like if you're a teacher? I remember challenging the status quo as a brand new teacher and doing it terribly when I asked rude questions to the principal during a staff meeting. So this notion of challenging the status quo while being politically savvy and the fact that that uh, has a relationship to student outcomes was fascinating to me. So are there ways to build in teacher preparation or professional development around these six dimensions? Um, you know, what, is, what does it look like to, to do discipline in a more equitable way? Um, whether that's about the inputs of the discipline or the outcomes. Uh, so I was fascinated by that and thought of it more in, on the developmental side. Um, I, I had a hard time envisioning with Dr. Dr. Currenton's work how we would incorporate those dimensions into an evaluation system, because I worried that in so doing, we would somehow um, pervert the intentions of the dimensions. So to be really concrete, like if we measured in the evaluation system, um, the extent to which uh, teachers developed personalized learning or not, it might just drive a sort of compliance-based approach to personalized learning that we wouldn't actually want to see. Um, so, and then in regards to Dr. Delgado's work, the thing, one thing that interested me so much is that the outcomes that he uses are value-added scores, which are based on student assessment data, standardized assessment data. And so I was really fascinated by this notion of measuring um, a teacher's contributions to equity by using standardized assessments. And I think someone had raised in the chat this question of like, what, what, are, what are you specifically using to define contributions to equity? And I think that's an area that um, deserves like a deeper treatment. And again, there again, I would wanna know like if you embedded some of these dimensions of contributions to equity in an evaluation system, a formal evaluation system, to what extent would that drive behaviors on the part of teachers that we would want to see? And to what extent would it look more like some sort of rote set of processes? So in all of these questions about policy, we have to really ask like, what behaviors do we want to drive? And how do we use the existing systems and structures or blow them up altogether and create new systems and structures to drive behaviors that ultimately are good for students? Um, and then finally, I would say in terms of Dr. Jones' work, um, I really, I appreciated the specificity of teaching students with disabilities and the push to us to say, you know, we've built these evaluation systems on a foundation that is content agnostic and student characteristics agnostic. That is, they're designed to be applied regardless of whether you're observing and evaluating a teacher in mathematics or observing and evaluating a teacher um, like Juliana who teaches multilingual learners. 
And so I think there's room for resources to be built. And um, Dr. Jones' set of, of work, he's already building out a big project to do this, but there's room to build resources that can support the specifics and the specific context within which teachers teach and the specific demographics and, um, and assets of the students whom they teach. So for example, at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, we built a set of resources and tools for principals to use that are really specific to the grade level and subject um, within which the, um, the teacher's teaching. So a look for tool, for example. So when you go into a kindergarten classroom and you're observing a reading lesson, what should you be looking for that is based on evidence of effective practices, again, aligned with the research? So I think there's a lot of room for those kinds of guidance documents and resources to expand our understanding of what effective teaching looks like. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, so I feel like as you were responding, it sounds like there are different entry points pot potentially for these different types of tools. It may be the case that folks might want to be adopting um, the use of these more nuanced observation tools in um, developing teachers. Maybe we can more thoughtfully look at teachers' contributions to test scores and equity using measures such as those proposed by William and his work. And so thinking about these different entry points, I know Heather, you already started speaking to this about the role of the state potentially uh, helping principals and school leaders think more about how to use and adopt these more nuanced measures. What might be some other entry points that we can take that we can adopt at either the state or the district level to try to leverage these more nuanced measures. Um, yes, uh, I, I really liked what you said about creating tools for principals. Are there other types of entry points, other leverage points that policymakers can use to try to adopt these more nuanced um, measures of teacher effectiveness? Um, here, I can start off with uh, Andrea, since I know Heather, you already started uh, discussing some of the ways that the state is doing this. Thanks, Olivia. Uh, implications for use. I think there, there, are, there are many um, potential entry points. Um, an important, I think, complication to, to highlight that Heather started touching on is this idea that um, administrators are walking a really tricky tightrope, right? And the, the tools um, and the processes themselves um, can be, uh, I think the word that you used was perverted, right? Uh, the intention twisted um, because of the dynamics, the really tricky political tightrope dynamics that exist in our school buildings. So just to make it plain, a, a, a school leader is responsible for, as we all know, right, for um, producing teacher evals, but also maintaining positive rapport and a positive school climate. Um, amongst and with their teaching staff. It's, it's no wonder why oftentimes the single, um, the single uh, which, which should be an, an ongoing formative dipstick taking, right, or, or measure or temperature taking in our classrooms over the course of the year with frequent feedback turns into a once a year, um, uh, a once a year, you know, a report that's given to a teacher with some findings um, without much of a conversation taking place. And, and that's, that's to say, it's no wonder that that happens because um, oftentimes administrators are um, trying to keep the peace in their building, create a positive culture. And we don't have a culture and a climate inside of many of our spaces where feedback is, um, uh, is building on a culture of trust um, building on a true culture of adult learning. So um, because of that, right, um, we're left with the, with administrators, you know, really walking this tightrope of trying to create rapport, create positive school culture, um, help grow their teachers, and it's really politically tricky, right? So um, in, inside of that space, I would say some opportunities for for entry points could look like, in addition to um, using these tools in coaching, think about, we could potentially think about creating um, or adding these, this layer of tools or, that create more nuanced, more robust information to whole school review processes, walkthroughs, and aggregating at the school level 
um, so that we can get a better sense, a community level sense, uh, but broader than just one particular classroom or one particular teacher and provide holistic feedback to a school community about that school's performance um, that may start to um, start to chip away at some of the trust challenges that exist inside of evaluation processes and also contribute to broader um, school quality uh, reviews and processes that are more comprehensive that really assess and quantify but also qualify school culture, uh, take into consideration student and parent satisfaction, that sense of belonging. Again, um, many of the dimensions, the six dimensions of ACEs could easily be incorporated in that kind of a school-wide review, um, as well as the nuance in uh, Dr. Jones's research um, that would give us a sense of a comprehensive set of instructional strategies, not just the ones that are highlighted in the tool like the FFT or, or others that are used. Um, so an entry point might be something like that, right? Uh, we're gonna take a school-wide look rather than a teacher by teacher look to leverage those, um, um, those processes that unfortunately sometimes are thwarted by the political undertone of the evaluation processes that we have in place. Um, I'd say also really specifically the, the racial climate um, component of the, of, uh, of the access tool could really lend itself well to a community feedback process that systematically brings community in to schools to walk through um, alongside teachers as part of a peer um, review process um, and, and expand, uh, expand the, the number of eyes, right? And whose eyes are uh, contributing to and whose voices are contributing to a, a broader definition of what a quality classroom looks like, what the interactions are like, and what quality teaching and learning looks like. Um, bringing the voices of those families and community members that are most impacted, I think will provide some of that um, counterbalance in these evaluation systems um, to, to, to push us to really adjust to the needs of our students. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. I was wondering, Heather, did you have anything else to add? Um, I know you already started t discussing the entry points, um, but I was wondering if you had anything else. Sure, I would say, so one entry point is at the state level. And so we are in the midst of revising the teacher evaluation rubric, which is a model rubric. Districts can opt to adapt to, excuse me, adopt or adapt the rubric, or they can create their own. So we're in the midst of doing that now. And after I read these papers, I sent them the findings to my team to say, you know, you should consider these findings um, as, as continued feedback for that process. So one thing is to keep talking to your state policymakers. Um, the other is that, you know, districts really choose what kind of evaluation system they wanna use. They have to align with the standards and the framework set by the state. But within that, there's a lot of room for districts to, to change what they're doing. And so there's an opportunity to talk with district policymakers, whether that's school committees or the superintendent and chief academic officer about the measures. But I think there's another element we haven't talked about. And um, this is teachers themselves. And so last night we heard from the teachers of the year and we heard from a panel of um, that included a superintendent. And I just think that there's a real... Um, reason for teachers to own their profession and own their improvement. And, uh, and it reminds me that, you know, Dan Lordy in the 1960s, who's a sociologist, uh, wrote a book about schools and he called schools the egg crate, uh, an egg crate structure, which, which essentially meant that like, you know, each teacher was in their own little um, space in the egg crate and like never did they interact. And one thing I've noticed in the pandemic is that um, given all of the terrible aspects of the pandemic, um, one aspect that has emerged as something positive is the increased collaboration among teachers because they had to collaborate with each other for, for so many reasons, not the least of which is that I've, if I got COVID or if my, student, my children at home got COVID, I need an Andrea to back me up with students when we were teaching remotely. Or you know, as they talked about last night, if I was substitute teaching in your class one day, I needed to know what you were working on. So there was just this increased collaboration. 
And I wonder if we might continue to capitalize on that using these measures um, from Dr. Currenton and Dr. Delgado and Dr. Jones to say to teachers, what do you think of some of these definitions of effective teaching? I mean, long ago when I taught students with disabilities, I didn't have the kind of research that Dr. Jones did to really be more specific about what are the instructional practices that are related to, to well impacting students with disabilities. And so I think if you went to teachers themselves and using the entry point of schools or using the entry point of pre-service or using the entry point of professional learning communities, um, and there are a variety of and host of organizations like the Teachers Collaborative, who was at the forum last night, who do this work with teachers. So are there partnership organizations that we could work with to introduce these these definitions and descriptions of effective teaching that broaden our, our definition, that broaden our goals for impact, particularly around racial equity. And, and can we do that with teachers themselves? So that's just the final thought I would, I would make uh, in terms of that question. Thank you so much, Heather. So I know we're running a few minutes behind, but I just wanted to have, I did want to address the Q&A that did come up from an anonymous attendee. And so I'm going to ask that, uh, that our discussants try to give a 60 second, really quick, you know, lightning response to this. Um, though, though I recognize that it can be difficult since it's a big open question. The attendee says, I'm wondering if we should come back to this larger question of what is teacher effectiveness and who should determine teacher effectiveness? Is this a conversation to be had at the research, state, district, or school level? And whose values and trade-offs are we considering when we make these decisions? So here I'll start with um, Andrea and then we'll and then we'll wrap up with Heather. It's such a great and core question. I'd say that um, I I have to um, in answering that question split myself between um, you know what the ideal might be right in a hypothetical or in, a, in the theoretical versus the pragmatic and practical policy related. Um, who should be determining that? I think we have to have. Um, uh, we have to have national, state, and district-wide standards that we, um, for, for fairness and for equity purposes, that we have similar ways of discussing, right? Inside of determining um, what those standards and what, what that bar is and the tools are that we use, um, I, there should be um, open, transparent um, processes for communities at the school level, including those that are served by the school, to participate in developing, selecting, choosing, and refining those tools and those definitions over time? This is a great question. I mean, as a state policymaker, I'm highly biased in my response, but I would say, I mean, I start from the place that, um, that we are, like, the proposition for schooling in Massachusetts is that we're providing all of our students with access to the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to determine their life trajectory after they finish in our pre-K through 12 system. And so you know, my team also um, develops in concert with a whole host of stakeholders across the state, we develop the standards, the content standards and the practice standards for students. And so we, it's my job to try to ensure that teachers are well supporting students to meet those standards, to attain them. And Andrea said it really well, like if, if we don't do that, then we're further exacerbating the inequities that already exist. And so I would say like, I think the state has a strong role in, in defining teacher effectiveness and linking that to what we hope for our students. Now, I would also add to her very good point, um, and I think someone put this in the chat, that we need to hear from students themselves. So in Massachusetts, we included student feedback as one dimension of evidence in our educator evaluations framework. And I'm really proud of that. Now, not every school and district is using that dimension. I wish more would do so, but it's really a critical dimension. And a number of years ago, um, some of or other research has found the link between students reports on their teacher's effectiveness and other measures of teacher effectiveness. In fact, it should come as no surprise to all of us that kids are much better at observing and evaluating teachers than anyone else is. And so we really need to include students. And I would also say that right now, as we revise the teacher evaluation framework, we're incorporating a lot of feedback, not just from students, but also from families. So this question of how do you bring to the table stakeholders who are highly invested in our system 
who've been excluded from those tables in years past? And how do we ensure that their voices are here? So I, I really appreciate the question. It's not an easy one to answer, um, but it's one which, with which we should all continue to wrestle. Thank you both so much. So I just wanna take, take a minute and say thank you both to Heather and to Andrea for joining us for this really important discussion about how to, how to think about adopting these more nuanced measures. I wanna say uh, thank you so much to Dr. Nathan Jones, to Dr. William Delgado and Dr. Stephanie Currington for sharing their really important research with us. I feel like today we've covered so much ground on how to expand our thinking and how to understand these more nuanced measures of teacher quality. And we've had such a rich discussion about how to adopt these tools, potentially decoupling the dual purpose of evaluation and, and uh, teacher development. And then also thinking about all the potential entry points to try to bring in these more nuanced measures, you know, at the state level, the district level, schools, and also trying to think about how to bring families into the conversation as well. And so I feel like you've all left us with a ton of uh, food for thought moving into our next session. So I just wanna say thank you all to all of our participants. Um, I, we do have to end our session here to, uh, at this moment. So thank you again. Um, I invite all of our participants out there to take a five minute break. And then we'll rejoin in five minutes, we'll say at 1041 to kick off our next session. Thank you all again. I really appreciate um, all of your participation.